This is part two. Let's go, man. So let's, uh, you know, let's recap. You got the Bell Laboratory Experiment. All right. This is the 432. This is the Frequency War. They create this horn antenna. You know, this Penzias, this Wilson 1965 that win this Nobel Prize because they are, you know, somehow discovering this this interference, you know, and they use their technology for all kinds of other stuff. In 1978, Penn Science and Wilson received the Nobel Prize for the physics for their discovery. What discovery? The residue. <laughs> the cosmic microwave radiation, 1965, right? So what they're considering radiation, what they're considering background noise, what they're considering static in their radio, this annoyance was a uniform signal in the microwave range. What they're considering annoyance is just a 7.23 centimeter, you know, wavelength that they're discovering. Let's see what they say over here. Oh, here we go. The Bell Laboratories. Bell Laboratories discovered this wavelength, which, you know, we know they're just finding out about what they're calling static in their system. Bell Laboratories happened to pick the system's sending frequency one slightly longer than the 7 meters. So now they're coming up with this 7.23 wavelength that is coming from everywhere. And in order to, you know, get their equipment working, they up their power 50,000 times, creating a very powerful field. So that the natural frequency, right, 7.23 centimeter wavelength coming from everywhere would not interfere with their agenda. Their agenda to create their own field of existence. When you create your own field, it's like turning uh, the, the knob on the radio, they said, man, you're, you're literally creating another world, another reality, you know what I'm saying? You know, it's the same situation. Everything in our world is a waveform, right? It's a waveform. You could choose a particular way of looking at reality or superimpose that view over the reality of harmonics and music. The dimensional levels are nothing but differing base rate wavelengths. The only difference between the dimension is any other is the length of its basic waveform. Just like a TV or radio, when you turn the dial, you pick up different wavelengths. Then you get a different image on your TV screen or a different station on your radio. Why did they really amp up their power 50,000 times to create their own station? their own radio station, their own very powerful field. So clear of interference from reality, matrix versus reality, so that the 7.23 centimeter wavelength coming from everywhere would not interfere with their synthetic matrix. For such reasons, I believe the 7.23 centimeters is the wavelength of our universe, this third dimension. So it is the ohm. Let's get it back right here. 7.23 centimeters is the ohm. The ohm, the sound ohm enchanted vibrates at the frequency 432 hertz, which is the same vibrational frequency found throughout everything in nature. We said, well, what's that? What's nature? Nature, according to the 1828 Webster Dictionary, is produced by God or the creator, the author of whatever is made or produced. So when they refer to nature, they're really referring to Hawa, the creator. Nature produced by the creator. We overstand, man, 7.23. So, you know, they're doing experiments, man. Everything is divided by this same number, 2.16, which is half of 432 to 7.23. Let's go. So we left off on this in part one. Make sure you get that part one, man. Let's go. 
Basically, Aum, symbol of the sacred symbol. Aum, right? Creation, preservation. They say destruction, dissolution. Um, you know, it's also referred to liberty, they say. 432 can be considered the sound of one's own heart. So we're talking heart bone. Let's go right here. A equals 432 vibrates on the principles of the golden mean, five, and unifies the properties of light, man, free phoenix. So we're talking about the dragon frequency to be able to see clearly. The natural tuning to A equals 432 has profound effects on your consciousness. So it affects our consciousness, our consciousness, our vibration as we are studying, as we are reading through these books, as we are meditating, as we are, you know what I'm saying, going through whatever suffering we're going through, we're being crystallized with our frequency by tuning music or musical instruments and using the pitch A equals 432 hertz instead of the music industry's 440. That's what we're talking about, the matrix, the hijack. Your atoms of DNA start to resonate in harmony with the phi spiral, the cochlea, the nine, the nine of nature, of what? Of nature, of what? Of the creator. Got it. Nature, right? 432, same vibrational frequency found throughout everything connected to our creator in creation five spiral the best way to experience a equals four three two difference is by listening its wavelength again is 7.23 a 440 triggers the left hemisphere of your brain where the ego and the never enough resides listening to this 440 which is what we do all day in our cars you know what i mean at work while we're working out we're working out to this separating frequency, brainwashing our left brain. We love our music, but boy, are they doing a job on us in the frequency. That's where the war is being fought, not in your entertainment distraction. Listening to music at this pitch makes us feel never, never feel full, never, <laughs> makes us never feel fully satisfied. <laughs> with any recorded piece of music that we own in order to make sure that we will always buy more music or it just makes you never feel satisfied. Makes you depressed. 440. A equals 432 is centered in the heart bone. Some people who are not able to distinguish the 8 hertz difference between the 440 hertz claim they can feel the A432 to be warmer due to the longer wavelength within the universal harmonic concept, the natural and sacred breath of tone, A equals 432, is used for tuning consciousness. So 440 is making you unconscious. 432 is making you aware again. Aware again. So what is with the standardization? How did it become standard? How did they put you... Put us in the matrix. I mean, we're talking about 1965, the Bell Laboratory experiments, man. Let's to get a few minutes on this, and we're gonna wrap it up, man. This is part two. We just, uh, we're just gonna, gonna go ahead and uh, do a head first slide, man, all the way home. Let's go, man. So before concert pitch, A equals 440 became the tuning and manufacturing standards for instruments. There was no international standard pitch, so they just came up with this concept of standardizing their matrix out of nowhere for centuries it was thought that the sound was so ephemeral ephemeral that any attempt to capture it to hold a ruler against it would be a fruitless exercise in fact until the 17th century natural philosophers thought it absolutely logical to make any or illogical to make any attempt to qualify it or even theorize about its measurement the first steps in frequency analysis were made in the 16, 1676 by British scientist Robert Hooke. It wasn't until 1834 that Frenchman Felix Savard, who built a machine using a mechanical tachometer, 
and for the first time demonstrated that specific tones were associated with specific frequencies. It wasn't up to the acoustic era, approximately 1870 to 1925, when scientists could start measuring sound frequency accurately using a combination of tools such as microphone, the galvanometer, vacuum tube, thermophone. All right. So let's get into this timeline of these concert standard pitches. Is what I want to make clear is that that until 1676, as far as the historical documentation goes, no one had measured and analyzed the exact tone frequencies. A concert standard pitch did not really exist as such. Musicians would tune by ear using one of the instruments of a group of references, usually an instrument that was least affected by pitch change. In those days, a wind instrument was the most likely choice to be used as a reference. Claims of exact concert pitches before 1676, for example, with the claim that 432 was used as a concert pitch in ancient time, seemed thus questionable to me. Well, you know, you gotta, you know, refer to the actual instruments and those pulling the instruments out. But we know we're talking about the ohm. We know we're talking about an ancient uh, sound anyway. So why wouldn't the ancient times be relevant? But let's go. We can find the following historical references. You know, these are left brain people. So they want to just connect all the, you know, you know what I'm saying, dot to dots. You know what I'm saying? But they, you know, leave out a lot of the obvious stuff. Clearly, this is an ancient frequency. So clearly, music will be in tune with the ancient frequency. We can find the following historical references concerning 440 as concert pitch predating standardization if this in this concert pitch. All right. 1834, you got the Stuttgart Conference, Stugar Conference, a, a Congress of Physicists, Dutch, Dutch, uh, a big long name there, <laughs> adopts Schibler's recommendation for A4 equals 440 hertz that's 1834 all right as a concert standard pitch based on john skeebler studies with this tonometer it consisted of 52 forks tuned from a to 19 two thirds to a 439 one one half at 69 degrees fahrenheit all right man so it is not likely that the striker piano company adopted Scribbler's recommendation for A equals 440. It is not unlikely that the Strider Piano Company adopted Sh Scheibler's uh, recommendation for A equals 440 shortly after the Stuart Conference. So this piano company started tuning their pianos to 440 after this Stuart Conference. All right, 1836 to 39, A equals 441, Paris Opera Pianos. Now the Paris Opera is in 440. Tuning fork owned by M. Leibner. Alright, man. Uh, 1845, you got the A equals 439.9. Turn in Italy tuning fork. That's pretty much 440. So A equals 441. The an Opera. So all these operas started tuning their operas because you know they do a lot of their rituals in this frequency. Uh, 1867, German physicists and and physician and physicist Herman Ludwig Ferdinand all right, published his work, The Sensations of Tone and a Psychological Basis for Music Theory, Theory of Music. In, in this work, Herman Hemboltz, Hemboltz refers to A at 440 several times. 1880, Alexander Ellis wrote an important essay, The History of the Music Pitch. All right. Skip to here, a, the A tuning fork with the name Striker written in ink. One of the prongs and measured at A equals 443 was found in Scribner's collection of forks after his death. You got the Britain Royal Philharmonic starts using A equals 439. All right. 1928, 1926, the American music industry reaches a formal standard of 440. So we think it starts in the 50s, but they said 1926, the American music industry, the American music industry. So we're talking to our artists today, these independent artists, they're really interested in frequency because it, it opens up a whole, no, no, 
a whole new rim, a whole nother rim in their creation. You know what I'm saying? Musicians today, artists, producers today, they want you to feel their music, man. They want you to feel their shit. They're like, man, can I put it in a frequency you can feel it? Yeah, but the American music industry might not like it. The American music industry might be against anything that's not the formal standard 440. But in 1926, the American music industry reached an informal standard of 440. Many did use it already before. Now pretty much all were using it in instrumental manufacturing. No supporting documentation found. It's all swept under the rug. So now they're manufacturing their instruments in 440 in the American music in industry in 1926. 1939, 38, the majority of attending members of the International Conference of London supports A4 equals 440. So now London is behind it. The conference is often mentioned in the Goebbels Nazi Germany 440 myth. I advise you to look that up, man, because they go into, you know, how Hitler was using this 440 frequency and all that. 1955, International Organization for Standardization adopts A equals 440. So the ISO or, or IOS, or International Standards Organization, they now adopt the 440. And that standardizes the music pitch, you know what I'm saying, to where we are today. You know what I mean, through the ISO, everything is standardized. Everything is standardized. All the matrix is in play. 1975, the International Organization of Standardization affirms the International Concert Pitch A equals 440 under ISO 16, column 1975. All right. Wow, that's how complex this is. And this is 1975 that they reaffirm the A equals 440. All right, then they go, go to the Baroque Pitch, man, the present 440 standard. Man, all right. So this is some great drop for you to get some music, you know, direct music historic knowledge. You know what I mean? Definitely want to look more into this ISO, International Organization of Standardization, 1975, man. You know, you can you know, get some drop on these docs. Specifies the frequency for the A in the treble. Stive or stave and shall be 440 hertz. Bang. So suddenly we are in the matrix. Bang. But not even suddenly. You saw it was a constant building up, man. A constant building up of all these dates going way back to 1934 with the Stugart Conference, man. The 1800s. We said a lot of stuff changed in the 1800s. And again, you know. This is another good research article. We always leave this link, geezapyramid.com, uh, referring to these uh, harmonics that they're finding in the pyramids and that this is nothing new. This 440 is nothing new. Chris himself measured 439, 440. Now look, they're talking about the king's chamber, the king's chamber in the Giza pyramid, right? The great pyramid without confirmation with the granite beams were carefully tuned to respond to a precise frequency. I will infer that such a condition exists in light is found in the area. While I have not found any specific records of anyone striking the beams above the king's chamber. Let me make sure you can see this, man. Make sure you can see all that, man. All right. Hopefully you can see all that. All right. So we're just talking about the king's chamber, right? And measurement and, and measuring the resonant frequencies. There has been quite a lot written about the resonating frequencies of the coffer or coffer inside the chamber itself. The coffer is said to resonate at 438. How close is that to 440? <laughs> Very close, right? Let's go. And it is a resonance with it. It is at resonance with the resonant frequency of the chamber. So the whole chamber is in this 438. Again, 438 hertz is within the tuning range 
for a natural, well, it's further from 432, it's closer to 440. Chris himself measured 439 and 440, so he measured 440, not 438. For differing samples of sound, he recorded in the pyramid, 440 being the most common tuning for A. So this king's chamber and this great pyramid in so-called Egypt over there is tuned to 440 hertz. And that's how you know it really is a frequency war, man. And we'll make our dismount right here in this sonic geometry, man. Again, get part one and surf the wave, man. We're just talking energy, frequency, and vibration. Wow. The story of human history, evolution, migration, and use of technology is a story that is missing many chapters. We believe we have fashioned a fairly accurate account of where we began, how we migrated across this planet, mm. and at what point in time achieved profound technological advances. Mm. But this historical account, again, in the pyramid, 440 hertz, is also full of questions and illogical pieces of evidence. To this day, we still do not know how ancient Egyptian and Mayan pyramids were built. And on occasion, an archaeological site like Gobekli Tepe, a temple complex built roughly 12,000 years ago in Turkey, leaves us baffled and forces us to reconsider the nature and timeline of our existence. But based on the majority of evidence available, we can surmise that, up until around 6,000 years ago, most humans were primarily hunter-gatherers nomads that followed favorable climate and food source to stay alive. We do not have written records that predate this time, so we must rely on archaeological evidence and oral history, which for the most part support the hunter-gatherer theory. However, if we focus our attention to a moment roughly 6,000 years ago, in the Sumerian region of Mesopotamia, we realize that something truly profound happened in the course of human events. Almost instantaneously, Mankind created the world's first written language, the first wheeled and axled vehicle, the first loom to weave fabric, the first pyramidal structure, and incredibly, a 60-based math system that we still use today. This elegant mathematical system is not only the foundation of geometry, it also provides the mechanics for how we measure the surface of our planet, frequency waves, even the passage of time. It is worth noting here that this Sumerian counting system based on 12s and 60s, seems like an unlikely and counterintuitive invention. One must assume that, since we have 10 fingers on our hands, humanity's earliest mathematics would have been based on 10, but this is not the case. For some reason, ancient Sumerians were guided to calculate by functions of 12 and 60, and it is this math that gives us 360 degrees to a circle, 60 seconds to a minute, 12 inches to a foot. So how? And more importantly, why was this particular system implemented? We can speculate and come up with numerous theories, or we can consider what the ancient Sumerians themselves wrote about this incredible moment in the advancement of human knowledge. Though it is not what historians want to hear, the Sumerians recorded in clay tablets that they did not invent base 60 mathematics, but were provided this knowledge by beings not of this earth. They describe in great detail visitors who, depending on interpretation of the texts, either came from the sky or were the kin of royalty who descended from the heavens. Archaeologists suggest that these are fanciful accounts, but to the Sumerians, these visitors were not mythical gods. They were abnormally tall, human-like beings who lived amongst the people of the day and shared a wealth of knowledge with them. Known as the Anunnaki, this race of giants is reported to have lived with our ancestors for hundreds, possibly thousands of years. Interestingly, in the book of Numbers in the Bible, there is an account of Moses sending scouts ahead to investigate the land of Canaan, which they were about to inhabit. When the men came back, they reported that the giant race of the Anak were still living amongst the people there, and were so big that mere humans looked like grasshoppers in comparison. Were we really contacted by beings not of this world all those years ago? And if so, what was the true purpose of their visit? 
In an attempt to answer these questions, we must first step into the open field of speculation, then see, based on other evidence that presents itself during our search, if any of this sky visitor theory supports itself in other ways. You're not on a ball. Don't let their CGI mess with your head. In essence, what we will be looking for are coincidental clues that, taken in historical context, will either support or renounce the earliest records ever written. In the first sonic geometry video, we were introduced to the notion that Sumerian-based geometry could be represented as audio frequencies, that if you played the sum angle total of virtually any combination of basic geometric shapes, from the 180s of triangles to the 540s of pentagons to the 2160s of cubes, you would get various arrangements of a numerically perfect major chord revealed by... Factor 9, grid built on 432. Now just meditate on this because you're just talking musical notes, right? You got A sharp, G sharp, F sharp, E, you know what I mean? So you got music, is mathematics. When they mess with your music, they're messing with your mathematics. When they mess with their mathematics, they're messing with your water. What does it got to do with 432? You're saying the A chord. Again, you tune your guitar by tuning the A chord to 432. The A chord, by tuning that, tunes the entire guitar harmonically down that 8 hertz. In 440, That's just, it's coming manufactured now in 440. All right, so the A chord is uh, originally supposed to be this 432. So you got the A chord, man. So here's how they say it, man. Each octave, right? When you, when you go in these octaves, it's like turning a switch. It's like going to another dimension. So you can look at, you can look at the earth basically being created, you know, at least this time around, right, in 216. You're still in the nine. Two plus one plus six is nine. Where we're going to, what the minds are talking about, what, what the energy you feel in or the pole shifts, it's like it goes from shift, 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 shift. You're shifting to 432. Now 440 is not harmonic whatsoever. So it has nothing to do with, with you graduating or or moving up in the octave, but when you move up in the octave, you double this number to get to the next octave. You double 432 to get to the next octave, next level, next dimension, right? So you're coming out of a 216, you could say, but they got you out of that now. You're off your scale, you're off your balance, you're off your harmonics. But as you get back tuning, now you're above the barrier, you're above the uh, false synthetic you know what they call it powerful field they made what they make in the bell laboratories man they made a, a very powerful field right they upped the power 50,000 times over what they would normally need to create the very powerful field so that the 7.23 or the ohm right 7.23 is the ohm which is coming from everywhere would not interfere they created a very powerful field. 7.23 is the ohm. The ohm vibrates at 432. Alright, so let's go. By a factor 9 grid, which in turn is built upon a tone vibrating at 432 cycles per second. 9. It should be noted that this key tone used to tune instruments has drifted up and down over the centuries and that 440 cycles is the current international standard. Mm. Does this matter? For musical purposes, it could be argued that any tuning system is as good as the next, just so long as every instrument is tuned to the same tone. But since all life can be expressed as energy held together by frequency and vibration, maybe we should be looking deeper at the numerical information revealed by the factor nine grid. It is interesting that when tuning is anything other than 432, the corresponding grid does not produce any intriguing numerical sequences. Mm. But when we revert to 432, and if we move up and down strictly by multiples of 9, an astonishing 14-tone matrix of synchronicity begins to appear. It's just platonic silence. For instance, on this unique grid, 
we find not just some, but all of the numbers representing every primary geometric shape. Looking deeper, we see many other numbers that have played into some of you. Really? They went to the Hebrew? They just put it right in your face, bro. Humanity's most profound religious texts, the 72 names of God in the Kabbalah. There is 108, the number of times mantras nah, and mudras have been nah. repeated in Hindu ceremonies. We find 144, a number sequence represented in the Great Pyramid of Giza, the number of days in a Mayan Baktun, or even the 144,000 chosen ones described in the biblical book of Revelation. And of course, there is 432 itself, the number mythologist Joseph Campbell encountered so many times in his cultural studies that he called it the most important mythological number in history. 432, according to Joseph Campbell, is the most important number in history. history. Standing back from this factor 9 matrix, we have to ask ourselves, how could the 432 grid not be important when it reveals so many numeric coincidences? Once again, logic stands in the way of us seeing a bigger picture. Seemingly, because any arbitrary unit of time could be used to measure vibration cycles, none should be considered any more or less correct than the other. We measure sound waves by the Sumerian second, of which there are 86,400 in a day, but we could just as easily have chosen some other span of time. And so what if the factor 9 grid reveals the numerical value of geometric shapes, the 1440 minutes in a day, the diameters of the moon and sun, and speed of light in miles. If these are all invented arbitrary measurements, a person could logically argue that these coincidental number sequences are nothing more than hand-selected data gathered to support a predetermined theory. And so we must search further. We must look for something completely non-arbitrary, a natural order or pattern of some kind that might serve to bind all this information together. But what might that be? And if it's here on this planet, why haven't we already found it? Maybe perspective has been our problem. What if the answer isn't on this planet, but is the planet itself? After all, the Earth does move in ways that reveal observable patterns. It spins at a rate we call a day, mm -hmm. and orbits the sun in a period. Dash the hijack. But were you aware of our globe's largest cycle? It is an extremely slow wobble that takes 25,920 years to complete. Known as the procession of the equinox. Now the interesting thing about all these numbers is that they all make sense. And that's what thought does with duality and creating a matrix. Instead of it being an earth plane that extends, you know, you know what I'm saying? You could say forever, you could say infinite, but you know, it extends more than, you know, we can measure it. They put you on a finite ball, but they say out here is what you can't measure. But in reality... In here is what you can't measure, and the numbers are the same. So if you look at the sun being, you know, whatever million miles away, 90, 90 something, 93 million miles away, or you look at the sun being, you know, only a few thousand miles away, the numbers are going to be the same. Uh, depending on what model you use, the numbers are going to literally match up. So they can put you in a whole nother model, whole nother matrix, and still have these, you know, whack. You know what I'm saying? Uh, BS numbers are still going to line up because that's what Thoth has done. He's lined the numbers up. Let's get it from here. They're just talking wobbly wobbly. Let's go. The physical wobble of our planet. What's more, we need to keep in mind that this system was implemented long before our ancestors could possibly know what it would reveal and share it in the only way it could be shared. Not by corruptible stories and myths, but in the pure realm of mathematics. In essence, it would seem that we have been catching up to significant information contained in 1260 math, slowly coming to realize that a message of sorts has been making its way across the cosmos into our collective consciousness for thousands of years. And just what is this message? In a word, it is harmony. When we play together as frequencies the numbers of all the primary geometric shapes, what presents itself is a three-tone, numerically perfect major chord. This phenomenon should not be taken lightly, for what we are seeing is a certain kind of proof that nature, as revealed by mathematical patterns, is a force existing in literal harmony with itself. So nature is our creator, right? And this is a chord, a sound that they're calling static. 
To further see how harmonics are represented in the workings of creation, consider the Fibonacci sequence, which was first shared with the Western world by Leonardo Fibonacci in 1202. This numerical sequence has been found to represent the spiraling growth pattern of many organic shapes, from seashells to entire galaxies, and so represents one of the most important mathematical algorithms ever discovered. If you are at all familiar with this sequence, you know that it starts from zero, moves forward by one, then continues by adding the previous two digits to arrive at the next in the sequence. So when we take our first two numbers, zero and one, and add them together, the sum is still one. From here, the sequence begins its journey. One plus one is two. Two plus one is three. Three plus two is five. Five plus three is eight and so on into infinity. Now, if we were to apply frequencies to this sequence, we would not get audible tones, as single-digit vibrations per second cannot be heard by the human ear. Instead, let's start the Fibonacci series with an audible sound wave. In this case, we will use the numeric value of a simple geometric shape, the triangle. With an angle sum total of 180, this is what a triangle sounds like. Now let's begin again, this time taking note of both the number and tone it represents. We start at 180, and of course 0 plus 180 gives us another 180. Next is 180 plus 180, 360, an octave above the first tone, and also the number representing the sum total of a circle or a square. And here is when things get really interesting. Add 360 to the 180 before it, and you get 540 the sum total of a pentagon, and also a perfect harmonic fifth of our first tone. Then 540 plus 360, and the total is 900. A septagon, and the major third required to build a geometrically perfect major chord once again. Moving one step higher, you get 1440, represented in geometry as a star tetrahedron, or the shape known in ancient Jewish... So, you know, people say, oh, no, you know, this symbol is this and this symbol is this, man. This is mathematics. These are platonic solids and this is the nine. When they say star of David, shield of David, it all goes back to numbers, energy, frequency, and vibration. And you're not supposed to, you know, worship these shapes and all this. You're just supposed to understand what it is, a triangle, which is... A triangle, triangle, connected, which is giving you this sound. Which text as a Merkaba, and which provides another octave of our first tone. Merkaba, man, that's your energy, that's your frequency, that's everything, man. So the Star of David carries a lot of sound, a lot of drop. Amazingly, when you apply the Fibonacci sequence to vibration cycles, the first six digits will always represent a numerically perfect major chord, implying that harmony, in the most literal way possible, is what anchors every Fibonacci series. Uh. And once again, we must acknowledge that we are not dealing with an arbitrary, man-made system to reveal these harmonics. Mm -hmm. Rather, this is yet another example of nature, through number sequences, revealing the harmonic essence of life to mankind. To see how the Fibonacci sequence reveals a spiral, as well as a significant mathematical constant known as the golden ratio, we will need to think spatially. Let's start with a square, but rather than a single square with a volume of one, we will once again assign a sonic frequency to this shape. In this case, we will choose 144. Zero plus 144 is of course another 144. Then adding these two numbers together, we get 288 or a higher octave of the first tone. Moving on, 144 plus 288 reveals our mysterious 432. Then 288 plus 432 equals 720, or the sum total of a tetrahedron. And you're always in the nine, always in the nine, always in the spiral, seven plus two, nine, four, three, two, nine. 288, that's 16, plus 2 is 18, 1 plus 8 is 9, 1449, log of 9. Before arriving at our 6th square and frequency of 1152, a higher octave of...
5 plus 2 is 7, plus 1 is 8, plus 1 is 9. The first tone. As you can see, the combined length of any two previous squares informs how big the next square should be, which in turn dictates not only the arc of the unfolding Fibonacci spiral, but also the tones required to build another numerically perfect major chord. Lastly, to arrive at what is known as the golden ratio, which shows up repeatedly in nature, geometry, classic architecture, even the design of the human body, we simply divide one number in the sequence. The inner ear, let's see that again. Build another numerically or even the design of the human body. So we see the inner ear, right? You see this little area right here, that spiral, that's the cochlea. That's the spiral in your ear. You hear the music on the radio, it's not in sync with what has been created by Hawa. You're supposed to hear the music in the spiral in the 432. This is the cochlea. See the spiral? Cochlea. Let's go. We simply divide one number in the sequence by the number preceding it. And though there are slight variations to be found early in its stages, the golden ratio carried out to the nearest one hundredth is 1.61. This turns out to be a cosmically significant number in our search for coincidence and synchronicity. For watch what happens when we square 1.61, carried out to the nearest thousandth. The answer? 2.592. The same exact number sequence as the precession of the equinox. To further explore the idea that ancient sky visitors were not only aware of Earth's signature wobble, but also the Fibonacci spiral and frequencies relation to geometry, we turn to one of the most famous Sumerian documents ever discovered. In what is known as the King's List, this clay document records the successive and seemingly impossible long reigns of various rulers of the region. Since cuneiform was the first written language, there is no way to cross-reference this list with any other historical document. But in the end, the names may be less important than the number of years the first three kings were said to have ruled. 28,800, 36,000, and 43,200 years. Do these numbers look familiar to you? They should, for they are all sequences found on the Factor 9 grid. But what's even more astounding is the fact that when played together as frequencies, they create the same major chord revealed by the Fibonacci sequence. That's the hijack Finding with these the, uh, perfect wobbles. harmonic frequencies a lot listed of in this ancient document is like finding a computer locked inside King Tut's tomb. Their very existence is irrational, far predating humankind's understanding of vibration and frequency. Are you beginning to see how these Sumerian murals and texts convey a logic defying awareness of harmonics, geometry, even the mathematics of creation? But what is more astonishing is that these murals appear to hint at a deep knowledge about us as well. Take for instance this image. At first glance, it might appear that this particular being is holding a piece of fruit or a pine cone. But further investigation reveals something far more intriguing. You see, what he's holding is not a pine cone, but rather the perfect representation of the pineal gland found at the center of the human brain. The only organ in the human body containing this intricate pattern the pineal gland displays the same swirling Fibonacci growth sequence as a pine cone, and indeed gets its name from the same root word. While we understand certain functions of many areas of the brain, conventional scientists are still confounded by this unique organ. Why does it have similar light receptors to the human eye? What is its true purpose? Though we still have much to learn, it is accepted by many that this gland could very well be what French philosopher and mathematician René Descartes believed it to be, the very seat of the soul, or an organ that, once fully activated, could open a doorway to a deeper understanding of our true nature. As we consider the Fibonacci design of the pineal gland, does it not stand to reason that numerically perfect Fibonacci harmonics could activate this organ? If so, Keep in mind that modern musical tuning deprives us of these precise harmonics. Mm. And it is likely that out of billions of people living on this planet today, few have ever heard or felt the effects of these exact frequencies. So you're hearing a lot about our heart bone, a lot about our pineal, you know what I'm saying? These are one, you know what I mean? When you talk about the spiral, both are in the spiral. One can be considered, you know, masculine, one can be considered feminine, you know what I mean? Both are in the spiral. So far, 
we have encountered much historical data suggesting that the people of ancient Samaria were contacted by beings more advanced than the culture of the time. Yet, amazingly, there is even more to consider. Perhaps you are familiar with the image of two snakes climbing upward around a winged staff. This iconic pictograph is often used by hospitals and physicians all over the world to represent the study and practice of human healing. However, what is even more intriguing about this design is that it also instantly conveys the undulating shape of frequency waves, the expanding spiral growth pattern revealed in the Fibonacci sequence, even the double helix design of our DNA. But were you aware that the first time this image, known as a caduceus, ever appeared in history was alongside the same Sumerian murals depicting the Anunnaki sky visitors? How long can we keep calling this self-checking matrix of interlocking information mere coincidence or an assembly of arbitrary measurements? What will it take for us to finally recognize that our understanding of mathematics, harmonics, even biology may have been gifted to us more than arbitrarily created by us. Though it hardly seems possible, there is still more evidence to support the theory that our ancient ancestors received information they could not possibly comprehend at the time, but would one day shed light on the mysterious mechanics of life. To dive into it, we will need to acknowledge two very significant clues left behind nearly 6,000 years ago, the base 60 math system and the shape of the arc as revealed by the caduceus. Combine them, and we are provided with an incredibly powerful tool, an arc of 60 degrees. Many people are familiar with what we now call sacred geometry, a pattern which can be found by drawing a specific formation of overlapping circles, and which has appeared in many sacred sites all over the world. The most elemental expression of sacred geometry is known as the seed of life, which reveals many numeric clues concerning the geometry of nature. The question is, how did we learn how to create this pattern in the first place? Using reverse engineering, it is easy to deconstruct and rebuild with circles, but what is it that would steer us to build this pattern if we had never seen it before? It is the 60 degree arc. With this tool, we no longer need to start with a whole circle and then guess what we should do with it next, because all the information is contained in this one simple shape. Eventually, no matter how or where you begin, when you start with a curved line representing one-sixth of a circle, you will be guided to create what we now know to be sacred geometry. Could this elemental shape be the true Ark of the Covenant? The Ark for which angels were named? The Ark that saved humanity from the wrath of the gods? One does not have to look far to see how this shape has been used to represent the all-knowing essence of creation in many different cultures and religions. Let's take a moment here to demonstrate what this 60-degree Ark can do not only in the realm of two-dimensional geometry, but in three, even four-axis geometry as well. It has long been known that when we stay in the realm of straight lines, the triangle is the most elemental flat shape and the tetrahedron the smallest solid. But is this four-sided pyramid really the most fundamental geometric solid, meaning it contains edges, faces, and points? The arc says no, for watch what happens when we take a straight line, bow it, duplicate it, then add another arc in the third dimension. Suddenly, we have a much more organic shape, one that resembles a pulse of frequency, a leaf, a seed, or the opening of an eye, a shape that also happens to be the true smallest geometric solid possible, containing only three faces and two points, compared to a tetrahedron's four faces and four points. This revolutionary shape, coined a trion ray by artist Michael Evans, could very well represent both a quantum jump forward in the study of spatial geometry, while at the same time serving to reconnect us to the moment in our past when humanity made its greatest technological leap in history. As we consider this trion ray, with each of its three faces locked in arcs of 60 degrees, let's direct our attention to the other significant number in the Sumerian counting system, 12. Watch what happens when we take 12 of these fluid shapes, then radiate them out from zero point. Of course, there are many directions these 12 vectors could go. How do we know which will keep us on the path of sacred geometry? For that, we simply refer back to the Sumerian 60, this time using it as an angle of deflection to form a structure that, if momentarily frozen in time, would look like this. And here we see something truly unexpected. When we use this same shape to connect the 12 outer points, we find four perfect orbits circling a nucleus, 
revealing the very structure of an atom. Or, if you choose to revert to straight lines to connect the points, you find the most elemental, perfectly balanced geometric solid, a shape Buckminster Fuller called the vector equilibrium, or the very geometry of creation. But rather than stay in this rigid realm of straight lines, let's return to the more organic, curved expression of this structure and notice another piece of intriguing information. When we add together all 36 of its arcs, each containing 60 degrees, the sum is 2160, the same as an astrological age. Then, if we multiply this 2160 by the structure's 12 external points, we arrive once again at 25,920, the master number revealing Earth's signature wobble. That's this the construct, which has been described as the Genesis structure, also happens to give birth to the energetic pattern known as a tube torus, a zero-point energy phenomenon considered by many to be the driving force of creation in the entire universe. Consider the design of an orange, or the dynamic pattern created by Earth's magnetic field, each one revealing the energy pattern of a tube torus. What else? As we follow the expansion of this structure, we see a perfect representation of the first moments of cellular division, or the very beginning of life itself. As expansion continues, the mystery of sacred geometry unfolds in multiple dimensions. Here we see an expanding matrix built with this structure. If we dissect it at a particular point of its growth, we find the exact same seed of life that has been inspiring our species for thousands of years. Amazingly, when we do nothing more than adhere to the 12s and 60s of Sumerian math, the geometric essence of creation is revealed. It is understandably difficult to believe that contact with sky visitors has occurred in our past, but for a moment, allow yourself to consider the idea that the Sumerians were not lying, and that an intelligence of some kind did indeed choose to reach out and share certain knowledge concerning the very nature of our existence. Now stop and ask yourself the following questions. How would this intelligence judge us today? Did we use the information wisely? Did we grasp early enough that nature, whether expressed in the orbital design of an atom or the spiral of an entire galaxy, is an elegant system existing in literal harmony with itself? Or did we lose the connection through pride, ignorance, fear and doubt, choosing to become the only known dissonant note in the otherwise harmonious design of the universe? Being creatures of free will, we stand at a unique crossroads in our evolutionary story. We can continue a while longer along the path of discord and destruction, or we can retune ourselves to the grand orchestra and participate in the ongoing symphony of creation. The choice is more critical now than any time in history, and you are alive in this moment to affect the outcome. All life. Bang, 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 dang, 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 yeah, man. When you talk about being alive to affect the outcome. Alive in this moment to affect the outcome. We are alive All right now. We are affecting the outcome, man, just by the awareness. Just by the awareness. Let's get a couple more minutes of this, man. Aha. 